Hey, welcome to Church Online. My name is Bianca. Thank you for joining us. No matter when you're watching this, we believe the teaching of God's Word can challenge, refine, and encourage you as you grow in your relationship with God. If it's your first time joining us at Church Online, hit the Connect With Us button above me. And if you're watching on YouTube, the link to our digital Connect card is in the description below. If you'd like to give or make an offering today, it's very easy. Hit the Give button above me at Church Online, and the link to give is in the description on YouTube. If you're new to church or new to giving, and you'd like to learn more about what the Bible says about tithes and offerings, please let us know. We'd love to direct you to resources where you can learn for yourself what God's Word says about giving. This week at Church Online, our Bayville campus pastor, Matt Huber, is bringing his teaching, Here's Your Sign, all about how we can become more attentive to what God is doing in our lives. Before we get to the message, let's check out some church news. Greatest days in our life are in front of us. God's taking us from faith to faith and glory to glory. Well, yes, we are on an alien planet, but the Bible says we're to be the salt and light. This is the greatest time of human history. God is moving like a freight train everywhere. More people being saved today than the history of mankind. More people are on the mission field, witnessing people. More churches are being built. Churches are adding on. You are part of what God's doing in the last days. God, God loves people. So, hey, Corey. Hey, man. Mark. Mark. That's my name. <laughs> Only been at this for a year now. Yes. Friendsgiving's coming up again. I had no idea. Young adults is 18 to 30-ish. Still no concept of what that means. No. Not even close. Nope. We shot a promo about that once. I vaguely remember that. It's a good time. Was it? It was. Hmm. It's over there. Oh. Yeah. Hey, New Beginnings. I'm Mark. I'm Corey. And we just want to invite you to our young adults, young adults, that's 18 to 30 ish. What's 30 ish? Like, I think 32, 30. maybe. Right. 34? So, young adults, 18 to 39? I feel like that's a little old. If you only know Dave Grohl as the drummer of the Foo Fighters, you're a young adult. You know, I don't think we're ever going to be able to top that promo. I don't even see us trying to. No. It, it doesn't seem very young adult to try. No. So, uh, I don't know. Cue the infographic. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, guys. Don't leave yet. Forgot to mention, the weekend of the event, if you're signed up, I need you to go to the info desk and grab one of, one of these, one of these pans, one of these. everyone welcome to church online this weekend i'm so glad that you're with us if i never met you my name is matt i'm our bayville campus pastor here at new beginnings and today if you're taking notes and you want to write down the title for the message i have this weekend it's called here's your sign and what we're going to be doing today is we're going to look at a story from jesus's life and ministry and in this story we're going to see jesus interact with two groups of people he's going to interact with the pharisees and he's also going to be interacting with his disciples who were, you know, the Pharisees were essentially a rule heavy religious group that missed 
the grace that Jesus was trying to tell them about. But in this passage, both the Pharisees and the disciples both share a very similar problem. Simply put, both groups were not very observant. Now, before we go into this story, which I want to look at today, I want to see how observant you are. So I'm actually going to, we're going to do a little exercise here. Wherever you're watching this right now, I want you to do something. Go ahead, and you might not hear this a lot during church, but I'm asking you to do this. Either pull your phone out and get your notes app open, or if you do have a notebook and you're taking notes, you can use that notebook and write it down as well. And what I want you to do, if you have your phone, get that notes app ready or get that pad of paper ready. And what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to put a picture up. You're going to see a picture come up. And I'm going to put it on the screen. And you're going to have 20 seconds to write down every detail that you observe in this picture. Where the, Maybe where the picture was taken, what colors are in the picture, what's in the background of the picture, so on and so forth. Any detail that you see, I'm going to give you 20 seconds. So it's an individual exercise. So Go ahead, get ready. I'm going to count down from three, and then we're going to start. Three, two, one. Here we go. Take a look at this picture again. Write down whatever you observe. All right. Stop right now with whatever you're doing. Stop typing on your phone. Stop writing on the pad. And, and I'm sure many of you maybe have observed many things in this photo and just in a short amount of time, and they're fantastic observations. But I have one simple question. How many of you observed the chameleon? Now, maybe you seem extremely confused right now. You passed him out. What are you talking about? I did not see that. Well, let's take another look at the picture. We could see in this picture, right smack dab in the middle of the picture is a big green chameleon. And I would guess that there's a lot of you, maybe some of you thinking right now, how did I miss that? It was right in front of my eyes. And that's a fair question because it was literally right in front of you. But the truth is, is isn't that strange when that happened? It's strange how sometimes we could miss something that's right in front of your eyes. And maybe many of you, you're having an instance pop up in your head now where you've missed something that was right in front of you the whole time. Well, that lack of observation is exactly what we're going to talk about today. So get your Bible out and go to Mark chapter 8. This is pretty much where we're going to be the entire message. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. And I'm going to read the whole passage at first, and then we're going to go back down and break it down. And I want you to also keep in mind that this is extremely important because Jesus does a miracle here to start, and then we're going to look into what happens with the Pharisees and disciples. So let's go to Mark chapter 8, and we're going to start with verse 1. So it says, In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he, sent, he said to set them also before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Immediately got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. Now, Jesus just did an amazing miracle that we see here. Jesus just fed 4,000 people. And also keep in mind, if you go to the gospel of Mark, just two chapters before this, Jesus fed 5,000 people miraculously. He just did an amazing miracle. And now we're going to pick up in verse 11. It says, then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. 
Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have no bread? But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? In these two stories that we see, I mean, it's really one story, and then after the miracle, two instances happen. Jesus interacts with the Pharisees, and then he interacts with his disciples. And in these two groups of people, we see something that I mentioned early, the Pharisees between the Pharisees and Jesus' disciples. We see a problem that they both shared. Simply put, their problem was this, that they both of them, they can't see what Jesus is doing right in front of their eyes. They both could not see what Jesus is doing right in front of their eyes. See, Jesus had proven time and time again that he is who he said he was. He is who he said he was. He is the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the Redeemer of all things. And yet, like that chameleon in our exercise, the Pharisees still aren't even seeing it, and the disciples aren't also seeing it in another way, which I'm going to talk about, at least not fully. And although the Pharisees and the disciples had the same observation problem, they had different reasons behind the problem. So first, I want to look at the Pharisees' reasons first. And I want to jump back, if you could jump back to Mark 8, 11 with me. So remember, Jesus just did the miracle, and we went through this, and it said, Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. The Pharisees approached Jesus here, demanding that he would go ahead and perform a miraculous sign. Number one is if he's just some sort of vending machine, but that's not even the point because they wanted him, they're doing this, they're challenging him because they want him to approve his divinity. But remember what I just said, Jesus has already proven who he said he was. Jesus literally just fed 4,000 people. And they had to be there to see it because it says after they came right up to him. And now they're even coming up to him demanding a miracle after Jesus just performed an amazing miracle right in front of their eyes. See, Jesus proved who he said he was time and time again. And again, in Mark's gospel, we've already seen it. Jesus, even before this, Jesus healed a leper. Jesus healed a paralytic. He healed a blind guy. He walked on water during a severe storm. He calmed the storm by speaking to it. He resurrected a dead girl. He healed a woman with a lifelong ailment. He fed thousands of people, again, by miraculously multiplying a small loaf of bread, a small amount of bread, twice. He's done it twice, and the list goes on. And again, we saw Jesus just feed these 4,000 people, and yet the Pharisees still come up to him demanding a sign, seeking, telling him to seek a sign from heaven. And then verse 12, Jesus, how does he respond to this? Well, Jesus probably saw the absolute ridiculousness of their request that was going on and the fact that they had the audacity to demand this from him. And in verse 12, it says, But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. The reason that Jesus didn't bother with yet another sign is because he knows the truth. And the truth is this, that the Pharisees were unwilling to see what Jesus was doing. The Pharisees were completely unwilling to see what Jesus is doing. No matter what Jesus did, Jesus could have performed a hundred miracles in front of them and it wouldn't have mattered because the Pharisees were unwilling to see what was right in front of them. And that is that the Messiah that God has sent is right in front of them and they were absolutely unwilling to see it. And, you know, I could, in ways, I think we could argue that that Pharisee problem is still in ways well and alive today. I think many people might not believe in Jesus because honestly, they're just unwilling to open their eyes and observe because there is evidence of God all around us for his existence if we would take the time to look. 
We could just take creation for existence. The beauty of creation points to a good Savior, but they're unwilling to see it. And you know, in ways, you might know Jesus is Savior and you might believe in him, but maybe you go through your day and you feel like God is never moving or God is never working in your life. When the truth of the matter is, you're unwilling to see God work in your life. And what I mean by that is your attitude. Maybe you're always angry. Maybe you always think nothing good can happen, whatever it may be, that you go into each and every day unwilling to see God do something in your life, that God could do something right in front of you, but you would be unwilling to see it. And we need to make sure that that doesn't happen to us. And the Pharisees we see here, they were unwilling to see Jesus, what he was doing. And the truth is, is if you aren't willing to believe, you will overlook or discredit or discredit even the most obvious signs of God. And do you find yourself doing this? Despite the evidence pointing to God, do you find yourself overlooking it and discrediting it sometimes? And if you're in that category, that's okay. But I'm just asking you today, would you be willing to look and observe Because if you do, you may find that you may have missed what has been right in front of you all along. You know, a good example could be, and I've talked to people before, and they might tell me that they want a job because they need to make a difference. They feel like they need to make a difference in, their, in somebody else's life. They want to impact people. And the truth is, it's not a new job that's going to bring them. It's them opening their eyes to where they are currently positioned by God and the fact that they can reach people there. But they're unwilling to see that because their mind is fixated on something else. We want to make sure that doesn't happen with that. And now with all that said, we talked about the Pharisees. Now I want to look at the other group, Jesus's disciples. And remember that they had the same problem as the Pharisees. They couldn't see what Jesus is doing right in front of their eyes, but they had a different reason behind it. So let's go to the disciples now. In Mark chapter 8, now we're going to go to verse 14. It says, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. They did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he, Jesus, charged them, saying, so remember, this is after, really quick, sorry, this is after the miracle. This is after Jesus just addressed the Pharisees. Now him and the disciples are getting in the boat. So then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, often that term he's using here, it kind of has an evil connotation to it, as that is what is small may corrupt the whole. And the context that Jesus is using this, he's suggesting a link with the Pharisees' demand for a sign in verse 11. And Herod's leaven embraces the evil portrayed, if you go to Mark 6, uh, verses 14 to 29, that is godlessness of the worldly man. So Jesus is trying to teach them a lesson here. He's saying, beware of the, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Trying to teach them a lesson. And then in verse 16, the the disciples, and they said, and they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied, and and so on. And then he said, you remember when I just fed the people, the 4,000, how many did you pick up? They said seven. We had seven baskets left. And he said, do you still not understand? See, Jesus had just shrugged off the Pharisee's sign, request for a sign, And he decided to do a little discipleship now on the boat by teaching his disciples about what not to do. Teaching them about the Pharisees and what not to do. Something like, hey guys, he's trying to teach them, don't start acting like the Pharisees, demanding signs, being slow to believe, testing God and so forth. And it was a great learning opportunity for the disciples. But honestly, it seems like they were too distracted by maybe their growing stomachs that maybe they were getting hungry to listen. And maybe they were just thinking about how bad they wanted to go to Chick-fil-A after this boat ride. 
all they start thinking is Jesus is trying to teach them something. They're thinking, wait, is he telling us this? Is he maybe mad because we have no bread? And they think about it. It is ludicrous for them to even think that. They just saw Jesus take a few small loaves and feed 4,000 people. The last thing they had to worry about or think about in this moment would be, how would we eat? That should be the last thing on their mind. They're missing what Jesus is trying to teach them, what he's trying to do right in front of them. They were too worried about, wait, do we have no food? Now, see, Jesus' disciples, the difference between them and the Pharisees is Jesus' disciples are willing to listen to Jesus. They are willing. They're following him after all, but their issue is this. The disciples are inattentive to what Jesus was doing. They are inattentive to what Jesus was doing in this situation. In other words, they weren't paying attention. They weren't paying attention to what he was truly trying to teach them. If they would have just stopped and used even a small part of, of their brains and just realizing what Jesus just did before this, the miracle he just performed, they could have learned something from Jesus and calmed their worries about dinner and what they were going to eat. Again, that should have been the last thing that they were worried about in this moment. But they were inattentive to what Jesus was doing and what he was saying. And, you know, many of us might be able to relate to this struggle. And many of us, if we're open and honest, could fall into this category. See, unlike the Pharisees, we are willing to see G the work of Jesus. And we believe in the words of Jesus. We believe everything he says. We believe what he said. We believe that he is who he said he was and he's done miracles. We believe that. But sometimes we could be too distracted to fully take it to heart. See, concerning seeing Many of us have many opportunities. I would say all of us have opportunities to see God moving and to praise him for it each and every day. From the sky to friendships that we have, to creation. By that, I meant the sky. Looking up and we see a beautiful sky. You see a sunrise, a sunset, friendships that you have that keep us going. These are gifts from God. And the wider we open our eyes, the more we will see that truth. And concerning hearing, I want to use an analogy quick. Wherever you are, raise your hand if you have a friend who seemingly is incapable of using their inside voice. And, you know, the friend whose volume is, is all the way always turned up to 11, the friend you know not to maybe sit by in the movie theater because whispering is an impossible task for them. We all have that friend. And if you can't think of that friend, maybe you are that friend to other people. But the truth is, is in a lot of ways, God is not like that. See, God, he has an outside voice and an inside voice. He uses both. For instance, in Psalm 29, it says God's voice can break cedars and shake the wilderness. But in Hosea 2.14, God says he will speak tenderly to his people. And, every, and however, God has both. He uses both. I would argue that God uses his inside voice more often. And sometimes we will only hear God giving us direction, whatever it may be. If we remove the distractions, we quiet our lives and lean into him because when we stop, when you stop and get silent, you can see the hand of God and hear the voice of God. But many of us, we are fighting distractions each and every day. Our mind is preoccupied with other things and God could be trying to teach us things and speak to us things. But just like the disciples, we are inattentive to what he is trying to do in that moment because our mind is preoccupied with other things. Our mind is preoccupied with What's the economy going to be like a year from now? What's the world going to be like a year from now? Am I going to be able to get this done by next week at what I need to get done at my house? And I'm not saying maybe that stuff's not important. That's not what I'm saying. But if we're not making sure we take time to get quiet and still before God, we can miss what he is doing each and every day in our lives. One thing I put into practice in my own life within the last year has been one of the most uncomfortable things that I have done. And that is I try to take time each and every day just to be quiet and to sit there by myself with no TV, my phone away, even no music playing, and just reflect on the day. 
God, did you try to show me something today? Did you try to teach me something? God, what happened in today? God, did I fall short in an area today? What can I improve on? And honestly, it was very uncomfortable at first, but in those quiet times, a lot of the times, I realized God was moving a lot more today than I may have realized. Maybe I was distracted. Maybe I wasn't paying attention. Maybe I was so angry at some point in the day, I was unwilling to even see God move in my life. Whatever it may be. But the truth is, I believe God is speaking to us and moving in our lives every day. And what if God wants to give you direction in your life, remind you maybe of who you are, use you to advance his kingdom? But the static of your life, the busyness has drowned out his voice. And I don't ask these questions to incite guilt or or condemnation. I say this because I think that we could be missing out on what God is trying to do in our lives. We're missing out on the movement and miracles of God around us and in us. So don't beat yourself up, but ask God, God, show me what you are doing in my life. Speak to me this week. Move in my life this week. Use me to advance your kingdom this week. And what I want to do is this. I want to give a practical challenge with this message. What I want you to do this week, if you have a pad of sticky notes at home, if you don't, maybe go and and buy one. What I want you to do is this. Every time this week that you see the evidence of God working in or blessing your life and or blessing your life, write it down on a sticky note and maybe place it in a jar or place it in a cup. So if God answers a prayer request, write it down. If a strained friendship in your life or relationship begins to heal, write it down. If someone asks you about your faith for the first time, write it down. If you get to ask somebody if they know about Jesus, write it down. If the person in front of you at Starbucks buys you a coffee, write it down. If you see the beauty in God's creation, write it down. Whatever it may be, if God helps you through a situation that you thought was hopeless, write it down. Whatever it is, write it down. Now, I want you to do that this week because I believe that God is working in our lives far more than we realize. And I want to challenge you to do that because at the end of the week, you can see, oh my gosh, maybe in a normal week without doing that, you would have thought nothing spectacular happened this week. I didn't really see God moving or I didn't really hear God. But when you do that, you will actually realize how much God is moving in our lives each and every day. God is very present. He is a present help in trouble. He's a very present God. He says he never leaves us nor forsake us. He's with us each and every day. But if we're not careful, we could be like the Pharisees or we could be like Jesus' disciples. Either maybe we're unwilling to see it or we're too distracted to see God moving in our lives. But when we begin to take notice of God moving and what he does in our life, our faith will begin to grow as a result. And the truth is, is do you need a miraculous sign to believe? Probably not. Do you audibly need to hear God's voice boom from the sky? Probably not. But if you would open your eyes and ears, you will hear God's soft whisper and see moments throughout your week where Jesus is pointing and saying, here's your sign. I'm with you. I'm with you. God is very present. Make sure you get the distractions out so you can see his hand upon your life. You can see him moving in your life. I'm going to go ahead and I want to pray. What I want to do first before I pray for all of us is if you are watching this and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and maybe you are like the Pharisees, maybe you feel like you've always been unwilling to believe that there is a God, Maybe you've seen the evidence of God all around you, but you've been unwilling to believe. Or maybe today your heart has begun to soften. And you're coming to the realization that you can't do this life alone. And you're coming to the realization that you are starting to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. He is Lord. He is the Messiah. He is Savior. What I want to do is I want to lead us in a prayer that the Apostle Paul talked about. He said that if you believe that Jesus is God's son and you believe he went to the cross for your sins and died and you believe he rose again. It says, if you believe that, then you are saved. 
If you believe that and confess that, he says, you are saved. So I want to lead us into that salvation prayer. So wherever you are, if you could just bow your head and shut your eyes, and I'm going to lead us into this salvation prayer. And you could pray this out loud with me and know that if you are praying this for the first time, you go from spiritual death to spiritual life. It says God's spirit comes and seals you. You are in right relationship with him. So let's go ahead and let's pray this. And you could pray this with me. Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that he went to the cross for my sins. I believe that he died for me. And I believe that he rose again. So this day, I acknowledge that I need a savior. I repent of my old ways. And Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord, and to be my Savior. I surrender my life to you, and I'm going to follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen, if you prayed that for the first time, just click that button, I received Jesus. Or if you're watching it on YouTube, click the link in the description so we can get in contact with you because this is not an end. This is the beginning to your journey. It's the beginning of your walk with God. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And we want to be able to connect with you and help you in any way that we can. And I pray for all of you that you would open your eyes and your ears this week to see God moving in your life. Remember, grab those sticky notes, write down the times you see even the smallest bit of God moving in your life. Amen. Amen, church. Well, God bless you. I pray that you have a good week. I pray that you see God moving in your life and you see that he is using you. He wants to use you to advance his kingdom here on earth. And I thank you, church, for being with us. We love you. God bless you. And we will see you next weekend.